Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Historical Geocaching on the Road with Geocacher Team and Photobug from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Today is very, very exciting because I am just so excited that I get, ha get to have the chance to bring to you my footage of the Joseph Bates Boyhood Home located in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. It was a lot of fun visiting there and to get to hear the stories of Joseph Bates in the location, the locations where they happened, and I hope you have as much, I hope you have at least half as much fun hearing these stories and watching the video as I had filming it and visiting these places myself. So without further ado, come along with me as I tour and visit Joseph Bates' boyhood home. This is Jim Wright. He and his wife live here at the Joseph Bates' boyhood home and in conjunction with Advanced Heritage Ministries, which bought this home in 2005, are working on restoring the home to its original state, which in which Joseph Bates would have seen it in when he was a child living in this home in the late 1790s and early 1800s, when Joseph Bates was growing up with his six other siblings. William Wood actually built this home in 1742 and the Bates family acquired it in 1793. Hello, Harold. Welcome to the Joseph Bates home, boyhood home. Joseph Bates was born here when he was one years old, which was in 1793. Um, I don't know if my husband told you about the previous landowners. Yeah, I mean, st starting with Hester Tabor, who was the daughter of John Cook, who came over on the Mayflower in 1620. Wow. Uh, we don't know. We do not know whether or not John Cook sold or gave this property to his daughter and her husband. But anyhow, she lived here for a few years until she passed away, and her husband lived here for several more years and had remarried and had more children. Anyhow, in 1742, William Wood purchased this land from the Tabors, and he built this house that we're, we are sitting in here. Not there. <laughs> I am standing where the back wall would have been. And that was the front door that my husband alluded to before. And it was from that post to the post just past the front door, which would be the post right here by the fireplace. And that was the extent of the house he built, two stories high. Well, in 1793, like I said, Joseph Bates Sr. purchased the house from the Wood family. At the time, like I said, Joseph was one and he was the fifth child. So that meant that there were seven people who were going to live in two stories. Two rooms upstairs, one downstairs. And that would not have been enough for the family. So we believe that Joseph B. Sr. built an L around the original house, which would take in this dining room where you are standing, and two rooms towards the side, which is now the front. Well, when Joseph Bates was junior, was 15 years old, he went to sea. I do not know how much of, uh, that you have 
told them about Joseph Bates? Or? Mainly about the, his theology regarding his teaching on the Sabbath and how he got the Sabbath and shared that with the whites. And so okay. So, so your, your that, kind of information okay. that I have not covered. Okay. So anyhow, Joseph Bates went to sea at the age of 15 against what his parents' wishes for, were for him. They would have liked him to be a doctor, lawyer, or Indian chief rather than a sailor going to sea. And at 15, Joseph was, had the passion of a grown-up for going to sea. He went to school right here in Fairhaven. I do not know whether you passed it on the way next yeah, to the high school. I think we did. We passed all the major sites except the bunker home. Okay. So you would have seen the school he went to, but it was not in that particular spot. It was diagonally one block towards the river. So the school would have been right next to the river. The river would have been right there. And we can imagine him and his uh, schoolmates going down to the river, seeing the big ships, listening to the sailors talk. And this probably compacted his thinking, you know, it influenced him on what he thought about the sea because they probably made everything sound very exciting. At 15, like I said, he went to sea. He left New Bedford on the Fanny as a cabin boy. He, his, their first trip was to England. On the way back, he fell off the ship from the, the, one of the crow's nests on the ship. And he was pulled up because one of the sailors saw him. They, they threw him a line and he, they pulled him up. And then everyone rushed to the opposite <coughs> side of the ship because trailing them for days had been a shark. And the shark was there following it because every time they ate or they served, you know, food or whatever, they threw things overboard. <coughs> Even if they fished and had scraps, they threw it overboard. So the shark knew <laughs> he had a meal following this boat. <coughs> now, if you know anything about sharks, anything hits the water or is out of or the ordinary, they are there. However, they... Joseph Bates Jr. knew at that point in time that the hand of the Lord of God was over him, was protecting him. Well, from then on, he sailed for many more years. He was captured by the British two and a half years before the, world, the, the War of 1812. They impressed him into service to serve on their ships. So he was a British sailor for two and a half years despite his telling them that he was an American citizen and that he didn't want to be there, but he was there. In 1812, when the war came, Joseph Bates Jr. and some of the, uh, the other sailors from the United States refused to fight for the British on their ships. So they put him into Dartmouth Prison in, in um, England. He stayed there for another two and a half years. So he came out around 1815. And his father and the, the United States government at the time was trying hard to get some 1,700 men um, from being impressed. I mean, that's how much. It was, might have been even larger than that, but there were at least 1,700 men that had been impressed into the British Navy. Anyhow, he came home, and he came home to this house right here, this home. Right in this parlor, he sat, and he told his mother, his father, his, the siblings that were still home, and a young lady named Prudence Nye, who mm -hmm. had gone to school with him. And he told them all about his adventures and, you know, what he had gone through, etc., etc. Well, he walked her home, and he asked her to marry him. 
And she said, well, Joseph Bates Jr., <laughs> do you intend to make a, a life, a, your whole livelihood forever, you know, your whole life at sea? And he said, no, I intend to retire when I ha get, make up a fortune of approximately $10,000. Well, in 1818, $10,000 was a millionaire today. So she said, well, okay, then I will marry you. In 1827, he married her? Okay, he married her that same year, 1818. And of course, he went back to sea. Now, between the time that he took his last trip, which was in 1827, he had be, um, been promoted from cabin boy to now captain, and he owned the ship that he was sailing in 1827. Before that, as he worked his way up, he had partners in owning the ships that he sailed. And a couple of times he even sold the ship in England or one of the other European countries and sailed home on another ship making money. But anyhow, in 1827, his last trip, he sailed out of New Bedford and when he was far enough away from the shore here in order that no one could jump ship and swim back to shore, he told them that it was a dry ship which meant there was no alcohol on board. The only alcohol was one flask of brandy, I believe it was, that was for medicinal purposes. Now, he also told them, one, you have to call each other by your Christian name. Two, you wouldn't, there is no swearing of any kind on the ship. And you know sailors are known for swearing. Three, there would be no gambling on the ship. Four, they would have to go to church on every Sabbath, which he thought at that time was Sunday. So all these things impacted the men negatively at first when he spoke to them after he was far from shore. However, he, they sailed and they did, he was a, car, a merchant ship which means they didn't go after whalers. They weren't whaler ships. After he had bought and sold all the way around the country and in Europe and South America and different places that he went, he came back in 1828. When he came back, the sailors were ha Okay, 95% of them were very happy that they had experienced his ship. One, no one died. Usually every ship had someone falling overboard because they were drunk or fighting, etc. Two, they also had their money, most of their money because they hadn't gambled it away. And I'm sure their wives and relatives were very happy about that. And three, they told other people other sailors about their experience and after that over 70 ships from this port of New Bedford went out as dry ships. So Joseph had impacted not only the ship that he was on but for future sailors going to sea he had impacted them also whether they were whaling ship, merchant ships or whatever because they saw the good results of not being able to do the things that they had previously done. Okay, so Joseph Bates comes back in 1828. He lives in this house, we believe, with his mother and his wife. And he might have had one or two children at that time. We believe she, Prudence was living with her parents while he was at sea. His father passed away three months before he docked here in 1828 as he retired, so he did not get to see his father before his father died. Well, like I said, Prudence and him lived here with their, their children, and 
Because he had $11,000, he purchased land on what is called, now called Mulberry Street. Now, Mulberry Street got his name from Joseph because he planted a lot of mulberry trees. His intent was that he would build a school for young people, boys and girls, and that he would teach them the silk trade. He was going to grow silkworms. However, none of the silkworms matured. And then he found out that what he had done wrong was he planted the wrong type of mulberry trees. I didn't know that there were different types, but I do know <laughs> he knows. He knew then, and I know now. But anyhow, he lived there, and he moved from this house in 1831. And he did different civic things around the town. He was very civic-minded. He belonged to uh, different uh, societies, and uh, that you know. At that time, if there wasn't any movies or the type of entertainment that we think of today. But anyhow, he, he built the, the Christian, a Christian church with two other people, Warren and, De, uh, and uh, Jabez Delano. Now, one of them is the grand, Warren was the grandfather of President Roosevelt. His middle name was Delano, no. Franklin no. Delano Roosevelt, and this was his mother's father. So he came to this town to visit his parents, his uncles, his cousins. And there's a lot of other historic people who came to this town, this town that, he, uh, at, that he would have known. Anyhow, in 18, around 1834, 35, he heard about the Millerite movement. Sometime in 1838 or 39, one of the leaders in the Millerite movement came to New Bedford to give lectures. He was invited to go and he went. And he believed the, what the Millerite movement was teaching, that Jesus was coming soon and that he was coming in either 1843 or 1844. They were not sure at that time. But so, anyhow, he believed it so much that he invited William Miller himself to come and give lectures in the uh, church that he built with the Delano brothers. And he came for a one week time and he gave approximately 15 lectures. Well, we all know also that eight, October 22nd, 1844 came and went and nothing happened. They did not know why, they were to find out later. In February of 1845, he received a pamphlet from Thomas Preble on the Sabbath. Thomas Preble had been impacted by Rachel Oaks up in Washington, New Hampshire. So anyhow, he believed it with all his heart and said, I'm going to find out more about the Sabbath. He had compared the pamphlet to his Bible, and they were true. He said, this is true. So he went up to Washington, New Hampshire, in sometime in 1845. He went to uh, Elder Farnsworth, Elder Wheeler's house. And he, he went, got there around 10 o'clock at night. Of course, everyone was in bed. And he woke Mr. Uh, Wheeler up. And they talked about the Sabbath all night long. And in the morning, Mr. Wheeler took him over to Cyrus Farnsworth's house, and they talked again until about noon. By the time he left there, he was 100% convinced that the Sabbath was the Sabbath. And he came back from uh, there, and he came was walking across the New Bedford Bridge. But and I assume that you saw it and you told yep. him about it. Yep. Right, so we can skip ahead. Okay, so anyhow, later on, um, because he had no money, he lived at 209 Main Street. This is just up the block. And you might have seen that also. 
Anyhow, he lived there, and that's the, the place where the famous flower story comes from, and I'm sure you probably know about that. So anyhow, sometime in, in the 1850s, him and Prudence moved to Michigan, and he helped formulate the Adventist Church as a conference and as a, as a church and, and giving it a name, etc. And pushing, not pushing, telling the gospel about the Sabbath wherever he went. And he was the leader in the group that said the Sabbath is important. And he had sent one of his pamphlets to the whites, um, Ellen and, 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 and Jim? James. James, right. The same as yours. Ellen and James White, and they did not think it was important, and they did not believe it at first. However, the Lord gave her a vision, and she saw the fourth commandment highlighted, and she knew that it was truth, and she started keeping it, and she also started telling everyone about the Sabbath. So he, in his dedication, whatever he put his mind to, he spent his money, and his time and energy in promoting the gospel and the Sabbath. And I myself wish I had half the dedication that he had in telling everyone that he met. There wasn't anyone that he, he met that he didn't talk to about the gospel and the Sabbath. And hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video of visiting all sorts of different cool Adventist historical sites relating to Joseph Bates in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. I know I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below and I will do my best to answer them. And um, yeah, so thank you very much for watching. Be sure to check out even more awesome historical geocaching videos at my YouTube channel. That's www.youtube.com slash tnphotobug. And until next time, this is Geocacher TN Photobook signing out. I'm having a blast with next.